summer. But in the meantime, he's going to talk to us today over Zoom about why sensory consciousness can't be essentially representational. Okay, over to you. Okay. Four to six, is that right? So uh, I guess I'll talk for up to an hour and then we have discussion. Feel free to interrupt if I'm, I'm not clear. Uh, we can be quite relaxed. Okay, so this is uh, some ideas from a book which is now in press, The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience. And it's a very traditional topic, something I scarcely worked on at all until the last 10 years. And it's the specific focus. It's what's the nature of the conscious properties that we have that we enjoy when we have sensory experience so i take it that hearing a middle c seeing a red square and so on is a matter of my instantiating a conscious property and and i want to know about what's the nature of that conscious property so the i guess the dominant view in this area I mean, it's a funny area, it's philosophy perception, a little kind of niche area, and uh, the dominant view is representational, representationalism. The, uh, the conscious properties I'm just talking about are one and the same as representational properties. I guess the, the second most popular view in, in the current philosophy of perception literature is naive realism. Uh, 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 Conscious sensory properties are relations to observed facts, and you don't have those same conscious sensory properties when you're having a, an illusion or hallucination. I won't talk about that at all. Uh, and then that's about it. And I defend in my book uh, an old fashioned uh, qualitative view. Uh, 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 conscious sensory properties are intrinsic properties, have no. Uh, you're kind of shut in the world of, of qualia. I mean, I'm just uh, making my view sound bad because it is ugly, but I think it's the only coherent view. Uh, and it's an extreme view. I mean, there are people who defend qualitative properties, Bloch and Peacock, but they kind of think of them as being there in addition to the conscious properties that are representational. And I don't think like that at all. I don't think the idea that that conscious properties, uh, any conscious properties or representation properties makes any sense. So in my view, it's all paint. Okay, so that's that's the background. Uh, I'm not uh, going to be defending my positive view. All you're going to get today is the negative argument against representationalism. So let me fill out the, the uh, kind of uh, mooring points here. The, what I'm assuming. So I'm assuming that there's two kinds of properties in play when we have sensory experience. There's conscious properties, I'm going to talk about them as character, the properties that uh, constitute what it's like for me to have the experience, what it's like for me to be looking at a red square, that probably goes away when I close my eyes. Uh, what it's like for me to to hear uh, middle C. So, it's likeness. Then there are also representational properties. I do think that in sensory experience, we represent the world to be thus and so. I represent there to be a red square in front of me. I represent uh, there to be a middle C sound in the environment. And so there's a representational property. I have the property of representing in sensory experience the world to be thus and so. Properties. And the question to be addressed today is what's the connection, if any, between these properties? And the representationalist view in the philosophy of experience, philosophy of perception, is that these two properties are essentially connected. In fact, I'm going to treat representationalism, we might come back to this, as the view that these two properties, two sets of properties, are one and the same, that they're identical. Because 
Now, I know that there's plenty of representationalists who want to say, hang on, not too quick. Sensory experiences have some contents. They're thinking broad contents that aren't determined by the conscious properties. Maybe the conscious properties are determined by the, the broad representational properties. So we don't have an identity between conscious properties and broad representational properties. Broad representational properties will depend on, on features of the environment. But representationists who take that line must say, on pain of losing their representationist credentials, that there's also a narrow content, a different truth condition, uh, a correctness condition associated with the experience that is one and the same as, as the conscious property. So these complications we'll, we might look at at the end in the discussion. So I'm going to take it that representation is the view that the conscious properties and representational properties are, are one and the same. And if we're going to get a bit precise, uh, conscious properties are, are one and the same as narrow representational properties. Okay, so that's, that's the issue. What's the connection between the conscious property, it's being like something, and the representational property, my representing the world as satisfying a certain condition. I'm going to be happy to talk about them as truth conditions. People, for various reasons, want to fuss in veridicality conditions, uh, accuracy conditions. I don't, I mean, it's, it's a matter of representing the world to uh, uh, contain a certain possible fact, which it might do or might not. Uh, uh, there's a condition that the world is represented as satisfying. Okay, so I said these are representations. Now, in fact, pretty disjoint classes. There's the naturalist representationalists and what I'll call the phenomenal intentionalists. Now, the naturalist representationalists are after explaining consciousness in terms of content. More specifically, they want to explain sensory consciousness, sensory character, in terms of sensory content, and then this representation in terms of some naturalist account of representation. So, people in this camp include Ty, Dresky, Lycan, perhaps Alex Byrne, uh, they're naturalist representations. They want to explain consciousness in terms of content. Then the people who want to do it quite the other way around, phenomenal intentionalists. They want to explain sensory content in terms of sensory character. They think that, that representational content, properly so-called, requires, depends on, Conscious character, when you have a conscious experience of a certain kind, that, in virtue of its conscious nature, portrays the world to be a certain way, and that's the real basis of all, all representation. And, I mean, main kind of uh, team leader for this group is Uriah Kriegel. He coined the term phenomenal intentionality research program. Uh, Charles Seward is certainly in this camp, David Pitt, uh, Angela Mendelevici. Well, in fact, Angela Mendelevici, uh, there's a bunch of people who kind of say they're phenomenal intentionists, but if you ask me when we look very carefully, they end up not being representationist at all. But we'll come back to that at the end. Uh, I'm looking at these people as having views about sensory character and sensory content. In fact, nearly all of them have rather larger ambitions. So the naturalist representation is most of them want to explain all consciousness, not just sensory consciousness in terms of representational content. And the phenomenal intentionalists want to explain all representation properly so-called and not just sensory representation in terms of conscious character. But I'm gonna focus on their views as applied to sensory experience. Okay, uh, 
I need to make an one to distinguish between essential and contingent representationalism. So I'm going to deny I'm against representationalists of any kind, uh, both the naturalist representationalists and the phenomenal intentionists. I deny that sensory character and representational content are essentially connected. I deny that there's any essential connection between it experientially feeling a certain way to you and you're representing the world to be a certain, a certain way. I mean, to, to make my position graphic, uh, no, 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 no I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for, for a moment. Uh, some people might be surprised that I'm denying representationalism because surely we can all agree that sensory experiences represent the world to be thus and so. And I agree too. I certainly think sensory experiences are in that they're to inform agents of their environment and to, to allow them to guide their behavior uh, appropriately. So of course sensory experiences are representational. But I don't think that the conscious element in sensory experience is essentially representational. I think it's only contingently representation. And representationalists in the philosophy of perception have a far stronger view. They think it's essentially representational. They think it's of the nature of the conscious property and the representational property that they go hand in hand. So here's, 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 here's a nice obvious analogy. Uh, words, words thought of as typographic entities, as, as physical objects with a certain uh, shape and color and size. So I've got the handout, and I, I trust you're all looking at the handout. Uh, uh, Sydney is the capital of Australia. Then it's falsely. I mean, I, I'm never quite sure whether it's better to have an example of a false representation or a true one. Sydney is not the capital of Australia, but still, uh, it, it says that, that, that Sydney is the capital of Australia, and uh, so it's representation, even if it's false. Uh, but of course, that typographic sentence isn't essentially representational. Just those words could easily have meant something different or meant nothing at all. I mean, it represents in virtue of the way that it's used by the English speaking community. And that's a contingent add on to the typographical nature of, of the words. And I want to say just the same about conscious sensory experiences. They represent, but only in virtue of the contingent way in which we've evolved and developed in such a way that our conscious sensory states co-vary with environment, environmental conditions. So I think sensory experiences are just like words. Well, they're not just like words. I mean, the, the contingent add-on that, that makes the words on the one hand and the conscious sensory experience on the other hand representational are different. In the first case, it's a matter of the way the words are used in the linguistic community. In the second case, nothing to do with linguistic communities, or not immediately. It's to do with the way that agents are embedded in the environment context and their sensory states co-vary with the environmental context. But both the add-ons are contingent to the intrinsic nature of the words conscious conscious states and so the representationalism that we get about those entities is only contingent you might talk about contingent representationalism which of course i endorse but but representationalists in the philosophy of perception think that conscious experiences are not like words they think take the conscious experience with its conscious nature doesn't matter what else is going on anywhere that will have its truth condition just in virtue its conscious nature. So, I mean, the obvious, obvious uh, thought experiment that brings out the issues is consider uh, a, a cosmic swamp brain, uh, right? So a replica of me uh, coagulates in outer space by quantum chance, uh, uh, my brain, uh, all the, the inputs and outputs, uh, just the same for say 20 minutes, so surrounding that, everything. Uh, 
I take it, I mean, this is a matter for debate, but just to, to illustrate the issues that, that that being would have the same conscious states as me, but I say those conscious states wouldn't represent anything. They'd just be like uh, words traced out on the, words traced out on the mountains of Mars by the wind. Uh, and the representationists in the philosophy of perception, well, they can go two ways. They can say that that state wouldn't be, that being wouldn't be conscious, or, which is a more natural thing for them to say, is that being would be conscious and its states would represent things to be thus and so just in virtue of their conscious nature. Uh, so that's the, that's the issue. Uh, any questions so far? Let me pause there. That's, that's all the setup. Uh, so, now we're going to look at the arguments. Are there any good arguments for essential representationalism? And if you look in the literature, the arguments are surprisingly weak. I mean, a lot of arg quick arguments offered. I mean, a lot of, lot of the literature on, on uh, representationalism takes a view to be intrinsically attractive, uh, maybe argues for it a couple of quick suggestions and then starts looking at counterexamples and difficulties. Uh, I kind of feel that's really the wrong way to go around th about things. Uh, I think if you think about the two kinds of properties in play, the, the conscious what it's like properties, feels like got a certain feeling, and the representational property, I'm saying that the world, or my sense of experience is saying that the world is a certain way, the world beyond me satisfies a certain truth condition. On the face of these are metaphysically very different kinds of properties. I mean, to my mind, they don't look like they're in the same line of business. And if we're going to be told that they're essentially intertwined, indeed uh, identical, then surely we need some metaphysical explanation of why that should be so. But in fact, what we get in literature tend to be often very quick observations. So many people, Charles Seward, uh, Frank Jackson say, look, uh, look, century experiences have correctness conditions, don't they? I mean, that's obvious. Who would deny that? Uh, so we've got to be representationists. Well, of course, I mean, a lot of literature does not make the distinction between contingent and essential representationism. And a lot of, and these quick observations like that one, uh, century experiences have accuracy conditions, clearly only get you to contingent representationism, not to essential representationism. Uh, I mean, I agree, the experiences have accuracy conditions and it's pretty intuitively obvious that they do, but uh, that's consistent with contingent representations. It's like saying English sentences have accuracy conditions. Sure they do. Uh, doesn't show that, you know, the word uh, Sydney represents Sydney as Sydney. Okay. Sometimes people say, look, sensory experiences fix beliefs. I mean, if you have a sensory experience that kind of naturally, and this is somehow overridden, gives rise to a certain belief. So they must have an essential content. Again, well, I mean, that's a more complicated issue. I might be happy to concede there's some kind of essential connection between sensory experiences and beliefs, but does that give them uh, contents essentially? Well, do the beliefs have conscience essentially? Uh, we can talk later about the ontology of beliefs, but somebody of my inclinations will say just the same thing about beliefs. Beliefs have truth conditions but considered as intrinsic states of the organism which is what is likely to be tied essentially to experiences uh, they only have them contingently another quick observation often made is that of course we describe in everyday talk and it's not clear we've got any other good way of doing it we describe sensory experiences representationally i told you about i've got an experience of a red square how else could i describe that experience I agree we describe, describe experiences representationally, but that's perfectly consistent with contingent representationalism. We often describe things by contingent description. This might just be another case. Here's this thing, it's a intrinsic state of me. As it happens, it uh, represents uh, uh, a feature of the world. 
natural way to identify it, that sensory experience that represents the future of the world, doesn't mean it represents the future of the world essentially. Uh, things stressed by Charles Seward uh, uh, against kind of people of Kantian Vedian inclinations that sensory experience is kind of uh, dumb until it's kind of got content breathed into it by concepts, by cognition. And some people say, no, no, sensory experience doesn't need the help of cognition to be representational. It's representational, it's all right. Think about animals. Surely their sensory experiences are representational even if uh, they don't have any higher cognition. Uh, I'm inclined to agree about that. But that doesn't get you to essential representationalism. That shows that uh, uh, sensory experiences don't need the help of cognition to be representational. It doesn't show that they don't need the help of something else that's only contingently connected to be representational, which is what I think. They need the help of environmental embedding to be representational. And as the example of the cosmic swamp brain uh, uh, illustrates, that might well be uh, contingent to their intrinsic conscious nature. Okay, so these quick observations are not going to get the representations where they need to get to. They need some story that will show us why these two uh, prima facie very different properties should be essentially intertwined. And I don't think they have the resources to do this. Okay, I'm going to look first at naturalist representationalists, uh, uh, go through various lines of thought, and, uh, uh, and I will end up with an argument against representationalism of any kind. So let's start with naturalist representationalists. So natural representationalists, as I say, tend to ground character in uh, representational content, and representational content in some naturalist tracking story. Uh, so you've got Ty and Gretzky, other people. I mean, I'm all in favor of a tracking story account of representation. Representation. I'm, I'm a naturalist theorist of representation, so I'm with the naturalist representationists that far. So I think they're right about representation. I think they're wrong about in thinking that representation grounds sensory sensory consciousness uh, so they will have some account of representation some tracking account that says intrinsic brain states represent the circumstances which typically cause them or perhaps represent the action the represent the circumstances in which the actions they prompt will be successful or represent the circumstances they're biologically designed to co-vary with or something. So there's an intrinsic, intrinsic uh, state of my, my brain, and then there's some environment circumstance, and the two tend to go together, and uh, we say, therefore, the, the, the brain state represents that circumstance. Now, given only that much, it seems, it seems perverse, it seems weird, it seems... Uh, a very strange view to say the conscious character of the brain state will vary with the, the condition that's distally tracked rather than the intrinsic vehicle properties of the brain state. But that's what the naturalist view commits you to. So I've got a certain brain state and what it feels like doesn't depend on its nature as a brain state, but on what it's tracking. That same brain state would feel different if it tracked a different feature of the environment. And a different brain state would feel the same if it tracked the same feature of the environment. Now, there's yellowness out there. I've got a certain brain state that, that tracks it. But if I've been wired up so that brain state, same brain state, tracked a different, different uh, uh, color, say blue, it would feel different for me. Uh, and uh, uh, if a different brain state had been wired up to track yellow, it would feel the same. So the feeling goes with the distal property rather than intrinsic vehicle property. So okay, put like that, it seems very, very strange. I mean, you can't think, why would anybody be attracted to that view? 
You might think, hang on, aren't I being too quick here? I mean, I'm just throwing you in intuition. And aren't, aren't there plenty of people who, who think that it's intuitive that uh, conscious sensory character should go with uh, uh, environmental facts? So the naive realists defend their view on the grounds that their view is the view that's in best accord with common sense. Now, I won't, don't want to go into naive realism, but uh, I, I just want to point out that, that the, the naturalist representationist view we've got on the table here is very different from the naive realist view and much weirder. The naive realist view is here I am, there's a red square in front of me, uh, my conscious feeling, the, the conscious character of my sensory experience uh, involves the fact that there's a real red square in front of me. And the naive realist bite the bullet and say, when there isn't a real red square in front of you, or having an illusion of a red square, it doesn't really feel the same. Now, I mean, I don't really like that view, but that's kind of, you know, you can see the attraction of that view. Somehow the, the real red square there is kind of built into my current conscious state. The naturalist representationist view is much weirder. They're common factor theorists. They think I can have the same conscious state when there isn't a red square in front of me, when there's a green circle or something. So it's not the local facts that are fixing the conscious nature of my state. Rather, it's the fact that the brain type ion is in general, though not in this particular case, correlated with redness. And that's what makes it light up the way it does. And that seems to me uh, a very strange view. It seems at odds with the here and now nature of conscious experience in a way that naive realism isn't intuitively. Okay, later on, I'm going to turn this here and now intuition into more serious argument. Uh, there's surprising little attention to this, what I'm saying is the basic implausibility of, of naturalist representations in the literature. And maybe there's a couple of issues. Maybe one reason is, is that, in fact, naturalist representation is very quickly turned to a, a different line of thought that makes their view seem much more intuitive. But also, a lot of literature worries about broad contents uh, and not about this basic fact that you're making the conscious property go with the distally tracked property. Now, of course, broad contents and that, what I just said, the conscious property goes with distally tracked property are very closely connected. But putting it in terms of broad contents makes it seem like a technical issue that you can kind of solve by arguing that sensory experiences only ever have that I mean you kind of you start cutting down the content they represent in such a way as to make them all narrow and then the problem of broad contents is dealt with but my view is even if you did that you'd still be doing the basically implausible thing of making your conscious feelings depend on what features of the world are distally tracked and why would, why would you start there? Okay, in fact, right, let me turn to the other reason that, that people tend not to uh, jump on this uh, uh, basic implausibility of naturalist representationism. And that's because they tend not to argue that the view I've just articulated is a plausible view, but they start somewhere else. They start with the introspectable so-called transparency of experience. So are we all familiar with this? Uh, I've actually got some quotes. So what can I do? Am I always enough at Zoom to do this? Uh, just bear with me a second. Um, do I have hosting rights? Who's? Yes, yes, you can share your screen. Okay, now I can share my home desktop or I can share things on my desktop. So now I share that. 
And now you can see a quote, the famous quote from Gilbert Harmon. Okay, so, uh, so Harmon says, introspect your experience when you're looking at a tree and try and tell us what properties you find in your experience. I predict you will find that the only features you can turn your attention to will be features of the presented tree, like I presume being brown, being hard and so on. And Michael Ty, focus on some object blue disc. Uh, 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 trying to discern features of the experience itself, it's impossible. You end up focusing on the external features, the blueness and roundness out there in the world. Okay, Harmon and Ty, well, certainly Ty, I don't know so much about Harmon, are naturalist representationists. But at this point, they join with the phenomenal intentionalists who also many of them will appeal to the transparency experience and here's a quote from the very influential paper by Horgan and Tienson the intentionality of phenomenology and the, uh, consider the experience of seeing an apple on a table picking up the apple there's the look and smell of the apple there's you grasp it is the feel the smoothness the roundness the firmness of the apple so the thought here is if you introspect experience, you you find that in your experience are worldly properties. Present in your experience are the kinds of properties that physical objects can have, like roundness and squareness and so on. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting question here. Well, suppose we allow that uh, these properties are in the experience. Does that, does that show that uh, the experience is representational? Uh, there's maybe a bit of argument needed there. I mean, presumably the thought is, well, because the properties, the worldly properties are in the experience, the experience is thereby representing those self-same properties to be instantiated in the world beyond you when in fact they might not be you might be representing falsely but either way you'll be representing because the properties are in the experience experiences represent by having the the properties that they're representing to be instantiated in the world in them now i mean you, you might worry about that line of argument but i'm going to pause there because i have a much more basic uh, objection worry i just don't understand the idea that worldly properties can be present in experience may be intuitive but in fact makes little sense well the naive realists have one idea of of worldly properties being present in experience you reach out and grab the actual fact in front of you but the naturalist representationists and their phenomenal intentionalist cousins who appeal to transparency have again a much weirder idea because they're committed by being common factor theorists to the worldly properties being present in experience, even in the bad cases where you're having an illusion or hallucination. So here I am and I'm having an experience as of a red square. And uh, it's an illusion or hallucination. There's no red square there. But still, we're told the property of redness and the property of squareness is present in my experience. And now I think that's just, just weird. What? I mean, what, what is it that's supposed to be square? Look, you know, the things in front of me aren't square. I'm not square. My brain's not square. My experience is not square. But still, squareness, uninstantiated, is supposed to be there in my experience. Uh, very strange. And okay, it's not like it's escaped the attention of the representationalists. So here's two striking quotes. I'm happy to say in the hallucinatory case, 
perceivers conscious of an uninstantiated property seems to me part of naive common sense i don't know maybe it is but it doesn't make it any better uh, and here's dretsky very explicit hallucinating pink rats we're aware of pure universals uninstantiated properties pinkness and rat shapeness kind of uh, in abstraction from any objects that might have them, the properties in themselves, they're present in our experience. So, strange. Uh, so earlier I, I said, look, it's very weird to have the conscious property I have an experience varying with the distally tracked property and not with the intrinsic properties of the vehicle. And now we're told, well, uh, that's because the distally tracked properties actually get to be part of your experience. They're present in your experience in some sense or other, even in the bad cases where nothing nearby has them. And I don't think that makes it better. I think that makes it worse. I, I, David Chalmers, developing this line of thought, says, well, the kinds of properties that present in our experience aren't really the kinds of properties that are possessed by uh, uh, objects out there. So he talks about edenic properties. He thinks the, the conscious character you experience goes with the presence of properties that not only might not be instantiated in the particular case you're in, but never are instantiated ever. Anyway, I just find that all, all, uh, a bad mistake seems to me out of out of sync with the immediate here and now nature of my conscious character my conscious properties that they should involve relations to abstract properties considered in instantiation in, in abstraction from all their instances Okay, that was all just rhetoric. I'm saying, look, it's very strange, it's very strange. But on the other hand, I mean, they're perfectly serious grown up people uh, who clearly uh, believe what I say is very strange. So, uh, do I have an argument? Okay, an argument's coming. And so now the argument is going to be an argument that will hit both the naturalist representationalists and the phenomenal intentionalists. In order to tee up the argument, let me talk about a paper by Per Sundström, uh, which uh, is a response to an earlier paper of mine where I just rested on the, the this is all very strange, doesn't fit with the here and now character of conscious experience. And in responding to his response i've i've come to see that i've actually got a, a nice tight argument here so what sundstrom said was i'm in no me david i'm in no position to to complain that uh the representationalists in make conscious experience not here and now because they're bringing in abstract objects because don't i think of sensory experiences, my being in a conscious sensory state as a matter of me instantiating a property. I mean, I started off by saying I'm interested in what's going on when I have a conscious property. And, and in fact, I'm rather keen, I mean, in the book and in, uh, of, of setting things up so, so mental states, sensory states in particular, the ontology is the only particulars in play are, are subjects, people, and then they have properties. And the subject having a property, that's a mental state. I don't want to have mental states as, as further spatio-temporal particulars. That seems to me to give us some ugly and unnecessary ontology. So, so sure, Perston Strong is quite right. I think of, of uh, uh, mental states generally, century experiences in particular, as a matter of a subject having a property. And he says properties are, are abstract objects. So here we have a relation between the subject and the abstract object. Uh, so aren't my sensory experiences not here and now? 
And so why am I complaining about the representations? And my response is, look, there's a big difference between somebody getting related to property by instantiating it. In fact, if we're going to be technical and worry about Bradley regresses, you don't even want to think about instantiation as a relation, but let's not worry about that. Let's just put on one side the case where I instantiate a property and on the other side cases where I bear some other relation to a property than instantiating it, such as having it in mind or having it be part of my experience or something like that. And I want to say the first kind of case where I instantiate a, a, a ordinary first order property, like it's seeing something to be red and square, we end up with a concrete fact, the kind of thing that, that can end, enter into causal relations. And when we, when we have some other kind of relation between a subject and an abstract property, such as having it in your experience or having it in mind or something like that, we have an abstract fact, not a concrete fact, and it's not the kind of thing that can enter into causal causal relations. So my thought is that here we have uh, uh, conscious properties, short they are instantiations of uh, conscious states, short they are instantiations of, of properties, but, but, they're, but they're concrete facts, they're states that are concrete facts. You know, instantiation of a, of a property by a particular, we have a concrete fact. And, and then the kinds of relations to properties that the representationalists are positing in, in particularly in comes out in the bad cases, are kind of looser connection between uh, a particular me and a property, and that looser connection uh, uh, isn't, isn't here and now, not the kind of thing that enter into causal relations. Okay, and at this point you might wonder, well that's all fine, but aren't I in danger of arguing too much? Because now think of the representational properties that I'm denying are essentially connected to conscious property, such as representing there to be a red square thing in front of me. One might have thought that that representational property is of some causal significance. Representational properties aren't just, aren't just epiphenomenal, they enter into the causal structure of the world in some way or another. But don't they, by their nature, relate subjects to abstract properties? If I can represent there to be a red round thing in front of me, that's a relation between me and the property of redness and roundness. And it's a relation other than instantiation. So it looks like I've argued myself into a position where representational properties can't be causally significant. I'm just going to close the blind here. Look. The sun, sun moves round. So, my response is, well, let's think, let's think more carefully about the causal significance of representational properties. Uh, are they causally significant? And I want to say, well, you know, this is a familiar issue. It's, it's, it's the issue of the, the causal efficacy of, of, of content. Uh, and my line is, well, representational facts, they have causal significance up to a point. The intrinsic vehicles of representation, the sentences in the language of thought, the neural arrangements, they do causally directly affect other such vehicles, other such intrinsic vehicles, and ultimately behavior. But in virtue of the intrinsic syntactic properties, the semantic properties that those intrinsic vehicles are related to external possible states of affairs, have no direct causal role. In fact, their causal role is a rather tricky thing. They, I want to say, program for the causal role of their truth makers. So on my favorite account of representation, which is pillar semantics, or may as well be for today, success semantics, the truth condition is, 
is that condition which, if it obtains, guarantees the success of the actions that result from the representational vehicles, or other vehicle, it, it prompts certain actions, uh, those actions will go on to distal success, just in case a certain condition attains in the environment, you know, I want to get a drink of water, uh, wants me to reach out my hand, that will succeed just in case there actually is a glass of water in the appropriate place. So that makes the presence of water the truth condition of, of, my, of my mental vehicle. Uh, and the causal story there is that in the good cases, the truth maker, namely the presence of the water, will combine with my action to cause the distal result, I get a drink of water. So when we do actually get some causing going on, uh, kind of in this representational arena, it will be in virtue of the truth maker, not the truth condition, uh, combining with other facts to produce uh, uh, causal effects. Now, that's how it works. So it's not the representational fact per se that does any causing. The representational fact per se points us to a kind of situation the good case where the truth maker will do some causing now that's how it comes out on my own account of representation but any account of representation it seems to me will have to tell something similar uh, it, it, there's this obvious question about the causal significance of representation if it's if it's a relation to a possible circumstance how is it causally significant and the answer would be generally that that relation is itself isn't in itself a causally efficacious relation. It's only when the possible circumstance of truth condition is actual that we'll get a concrete fact that will feature as a cause and effect or effect. So now I've got a general argument. And uh, I'm at page 10 on the handout. So instantiations of conscious sensory properties yield concrete facts that have causes and effects. Instantiations of representational properties yield abstract facts that cannot feature as causes and effects. It's only they point to truth makers, which when they obtain will be concrete facts that feature causes and effects. So sensory properties cannot be one and the same as representational properties. They're incommensurable. They have a different kind of dimensionality. So that's, that's the, the substantial argument that I think of as lying behind all that rhetoric about uh, all these representationists failed to re respect the here and now nature of concrete, of conscious, conscious properties. Conscious properties enter into concrete facts, representational properties do not, they can't be the same. Okay, just to wrap up, I'm going to say a little bit about the phenomenal intentionalists. And a surprising number of phenomenal intentionalists will in fact make common cause with me against people who appeal to transparency. Uh, Uriah Kriegel's got a couple of papers about the veil of abstractor and the uh, explanatory closure of the concrete, where he's very uneasy about the idea that uninstantiated properties can be present in, in sensory experiences. Uh, Charles Seward is also suspicious of that, that idea. And you get plenty of, and Brian Law, very much, very much so. Uh, Brian Law's wonderful last, last paper. Uh, so these are people who, who are identified as phenomenal intentionalists, but in fact will agree with me that this idea of abstract properties being present in sensory experiences makes no sense. And what they retreat to, many of them, is an account that says, look, look at sensory experience. It has a very rich structure. It's a very rich structure. Well, uh, well, there's a number of things they they say. Some of them want to say it doesn't relate us 
to abstract property. Some of, some of them want to go say it further and say it doesn't even relate us to, to truth conditions. Mendelevici is explicit about that. Brian Law is explicit about that. But still, they want to say we're intentionless, that, that sensory experience in somehow is intrinsically pointing, even though it doesn't involve worldly properties and maybe doesn't even uh, constitutively involve truth conditions. I think that at this point, their position has collapsed into mine. Uh, they are, I agree, of course, that sensory experience has a very rich uh, structure. And I want to say, well, that's just intrinsic facts about sensory experience, and it doesn't mean it's essentially representational. There's a lot of things to talk about here. Let me just go through two quick thoughts. So here's two good thoughts, which a lot of people in this intentionalist camp take to show that in some sense, sensory experience has a, a pointiness and intentionality uh, that's something to do with representation. And I'm gonna say, look, while these thoughts are good enough thoughts, they don't really get you through to that conclusion. Okay, one line of thought is that sensory experience seems representational. It certainly seems when you introspect that perhaps it involves worldly properties, absolutely natural thought, many people, people have it. Certainly seems when you introspect that uh, your experience is, is representing uh, a mind independent realm beyond you. And if you look at, look at papers by Farkas and by, by Law, they're quite interesting on exactly how that appearance is, is constituted. But it's not enough to show that something's essentially representational to establish that it seems representational. Well, it depends what seems means here, but if we can talk about this a bit more, if seems just means seduces you into the belief that experience is representational, which, which is a lot of what Farkas and Law establish, that doesn't mean that experience really is essentially representational, it just means that it has a structure that makes it very easy to end up believing that it's representational. But if that belief is a mistake, well, there's a sense in which experience seems representational, but the belief's a mistake, and, and it isn't really representational. And law has a rather complicated argument involving uh, 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 the, the connection between the stable features you experience. You mentioned you're hallucinating a, a yellow lemon and intentional objects, objects that might or might not exist and I've reconstructed in my book showing you how that if you conflate the the thing that might or might not exist with uh, the the stable yellow feature of your experience you're going to end up concluding that experience is representational and the properties are present in your experience and it's it's, it's a very natural and uh, obvious line of thought but Laura and I would agree that that line of thought is a mistake and you're reasoning on the basis of a confusion. So uh, the fact that experience seems representational in that way does not mean that it is. Second thought is that experience is clearly being evolved so that it's very well suited to representing and and all you have to do is to plug it into the environment that we're actually in and bingo it represents and in fact it's all being geared up in the way it has to do just that job and uh yeah sure uh, uh you need funny thought experiments like the cosmic swamp brain to bring out that uh you could have just the same consciousness even without its doing that job so of course I agree that uh, uh, experience is 
is very well suited indeed has evolved uh, to uh, be such that when it's plugged into an environment it it represents but that doesn't show that intrinsic represents after all my pure paint view which says that experiences are just like intrinsically dumb words agrees entirely with the fact that it's evolved to be such that when it's plugged into an environment it represents so just pointing to the rich intrinsic structure of experience uh, is not going to get you to the conclusion that experience is essentially representational so i'm going to stop stop there thanks